Happy Easter to City Church. How's everybody doing? Woo! Guys, this is the Christian Super Bowl, okay? Guys, don't you just love that video? If you haven't got the message of that video, I want to make it super clear. Everybody needs Jesus and nobody is too far gone. In fact, the message of Easter, if you're new, is this. God comes to us because we couldn't go to him. And God meets us where we are. Let me ask you this evening, where are you spiritually? What's interesting about the story of Mark is Mark was in what we would call rebellion, right? The video opens up, and you're like, is that a mega death poster? You know what I mean? Mark was living a life of rebellion, and, that's, and that relates to some of you. I had a guy come up to me on Thursday night, okay? We had a service Thursday night. Comes up to me afterwards crying, says, I am that guy in the video. God meets you where you are in your rebellion. God meets you where you are in your religion in your pretending and in your performing. But God meets you where you are, but he never keeps you where you are. The message of Easter is that God became a man to reach man. See, religion is our attempt to try to reach God, and Christianity is God's pursuit of man. Now, I'm just gonna tell you right up front, okay? By the way, my uh, Christmas, or Christmas, sorry, I get those confused. My Easter gift to you is a slightly shorter sermon this evening, okay? Because we got all these incredible videos and other, other things in baptisms. But I just wanna tell you real simply what, what the main message is. And here we wanna make the main things the plain things and the plain things the main things. And there's a couple of you here today, or maybe many of you here today, that I only get you for Christmas and then I get you for Easter. That's it, you're CEOs, Christmas, Easter only. And we are so glad you're here. <laughs> and every time you come, you're like, I don't wanna keep going. All he talks about is the virgin birth and the resurrection. Well. We're open all year, so come back another time, guys. We'd love to have you here. This is a, okay. But here, here's the main message of Easter. The main message of Easter, and actually it's the main message of Christianity, that's why this is so important, is either the tomb is empty or Christianity is. And if you don't remember anything else that I say this evening, I hope you'll think about that. Either the tomb is empty, that means Jesus is risen and reigning and alive and everything we sung about there. Either the tomb is empty or Christianity is. Now, you might find this interesting. If you don't know the Bible very well, that's totally fine. The Bible critiques itself in this kind of strange place in the Bible. The Apostle Paul, he's this guy who becomes a Christian and he's like the first you know, great Christian church planner, all this kind of stuff. He basically says, guys, he says, think about this logically with me. He says, if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, he says, we're the most of all men to be pitied. He says, basically, why am I suffering like I'm suffering if Jesus didn't rise from the dead? And then, then, he, then he kind of takes it logically. He goes, guys, here's the bad news. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, I'm a false teacher. So here, here's the whole thing. The empty tomb, if it's true, we should be all in. And if the tomb isn't empty, we should move on. Like if tomorrow in the New York Times, or maybe a paper that you trust, I don't know, whatever it is, whatever, whatever news source you would trust, if it, in the front page it said, we found 100% for sure, the bones of Jesus Christ in the Middle East. What effect would that have on your life? Depends how all in you are right now. Depends how much you're staking your entire life on the truth of the empty tomb. Now look, I know we're not all there, guys. Look, I mean, some of you, you know, and a friend invited you and you came. Look, there's all types of people. Every time the church gathers, there's all types of people. But especially on Easter, there's all types of people. Do you hear the story about the guy who didn't want to go to church? He said to his wife, I don't want to go to church. Everyone's mean to me at church. He says, and actually, they're very suspicious of me at church. And she says, honey, come on. They're not mean. And they're not suspicious of you. And also, you're the pastor. <laughs> Conversation we had earlier this evening. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I know that every time the church gathers... There are genuine saints. That's the biblical word for believers. You're excited. You hope we sing a certain song, all that kind of stuff. You see your friends. There are those who are seekers. It's interesting. The Bible says if you seek God with all your heart, you'll find him. And what I found in my 20 years of ministry is God is working on different people's hearts at different times in their lives. And someone becomes a seeker. They're spiritually curious. They're spiritually questioning. They're spiritually confused. Maybe they found the religions of the world, right? Right? Well, materialism, the more I have in my hand, the happier I'll be in my heart. Consumerism, individualism, they found them wanting and bankrupt. And if you're here today as a seeker, I am so excited for you because guess what? It was 23 years ago this week that I came to Christ. 
And I know what it's like to be a seeker. I know what it's like to say, I don't know if Christianity is true, but I want it to be true. Well, I hope to help you tonight. Others of you, you're here and you're skeptical, and that's okay. I just want to say, you don't really want to be here, and thank you, okay? Thank you for being here. This is your Easter gift to your dad or your mom or your friend, right? You offered to guard the Easter baskets, but that didn't work, okay? So you're here. So we are so glad that you're here. Guys, we have, last thing, and then we're getting to the text. Uh, guys, we have two desires. I just figured I would just, we're, this is the kind of church we are. We just put all the cards on the table, you know, just say this is what we're trying to do. It's okay, so what are we trying to do? If you're new or you've been coming around for a while, here, we have two desires. Number one, we want you to believe and become a Christian. There was this one time the Apostle Paul, this guy, the same guy who wrote a lot of the Bible, he's, he's like before this governor, and the governor goes, what do you want me to do, Paul? And he says, I'd like you to become a Christian. I'd like you to become just like me, except for these chains. We want you to become, we care about your soul. We don't view you as a project. We don't have an agenda. We're gonna love you no matter what. But we believe that everyone spends somewhere forever. The second desire, and this is for some of you, right? We want you to be a part of a local church. And there's too many of you, and I love you, so hear me say this. In the most spirit-filled, winsome, Christ-centered, humble way, hear me say this. Some of you are spiritually homeless. You're a believer, but you don't... Now, a human without a home, we call them homeless and we feel bad for them. I've seen this in Winston-Salem. People do what I would call spiritual Airbnb. Or spiritual verbo. Let's, let's rent this church for the weekend, see how it is. Let's rent this church for the weekend, see how it is. I want to encourage you to buy. I want to encourage you to put down some roots because so many of you are in the exact same place you've always been because you haven't meaningfully connected yourself to community. With that said, I want to take us back to the earliest account of Christianity and of the story of Easter, of the resurrection. If you'll turn to 1 Corinthians 15, I know many of you don't have a Bible, you can type to, swipe to, scroll to, get to, however you want to. It's gonna be behind me on the screen. Guys, this was written in 54 AD. That's 21 years after Jesus died and rose from the dead. And what I'm gonna read to you today, the confession that's in here, they think was just written a few months after Jesus rose from the dead. Let me read this to you. This is 1 Corinthians 15, verses one and two. Now I would remind you, why? Because people forget things. Now I would remind you, brothers, the gospel makes you a family, of the gospel, we gotta talk about that word, that I preach to you, that's what I'm doing right now, which you, look at all the things you're supposed to do with the gospel, are you doing this? In which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if, because you might not do this. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain or believed for no purpose. I wanna talk to you today about the gospel because there was this great monk turned reformer. His name's Martin Luther. It's not that important that you know a lot about him, but he said something really interesting. He goes, I love the Bible. He says, you know why I love the Bible? He says, I love the Bible because the Bible holds the gospel. He says, and it's the gospel that holds Christ. So we gotta talk about the gospel, guys. If I went around downtown or I went over to Wake Forest University or I went over to Winston State and I interviewed a bunch of kids or young men and young women there and I said, guys, what's the gospel? You know what they're gonna tell me? A genre of music. Guys, it's not a word we use today. When you become a Christian, you need to get a new vocabulary, right? You know this, if you're in any special industry, right? You're an engineer, new vocabulary. Lawyer, new vocabulary. Doctor, new vocabulary. Business guy, finance guy, you got a new vocabulary. There's certain words you better learn. If you are going, whether you're seeker, skeptic, or believer, you gotta know what the word gospel means. Gospel is the good news about what Jesus Christ did for us. That's what it is. In fact, the gospel created the church. So let me take a real cynical view of the church. Here's a cynical view of the church that you'll find. Ah, the church. You know, it's a bunch of old guys. It's male, pale, and frail, you know, all these old guys. And they wrote, a, they wrote a book. And so really what happened was the church created the Bible. It's like, nope, wrong. You got it reversed. The Bible created the church because the Bible holds the gospel. Listen, it's not easy. Think about this for a minute. I mean, look around for a second. It's like, how did we get here? 
And by here, I mean like, how is it that a billion people worship Jesus when it started out with 12 guys who were uneducated and from not from the right families and from a strange small part of the Middle East? How did we get here? Listen, you cannot describe the birth, the survival, and the massive explosion of the church of Jesus Christ apart from the gospel message. And in the gospel is Christ. And the central thing that Christ did was die and rise on our behalf. Guys, when you think of church, here's what people think of when they think of church. The most boring hour of my week. When most people think of church, they think of fighting with their husband, fighting with their wife. They think of a building, guys, the church. There is no organization on, on earth that has had the influence of the church. Just, you think it's an accident that our hospital is called Wake Forest Baptist? The church, <laughs> hospitals, schools, nonprofits, and it all comes from the gospel. Now, what is the gospel? The gospel is good news, guys. I, some of you tonight, probably most of us, you need some good news, right? Especially ever since COVID, we have lived in a world of bad news, right? I don't remember, can't remember what day it was, but, but someday this week, same thing happened to you. You woke up and however you get your news, you heard about that horrible, story of what happened in Baltimore. And you saw, most of us I'm sure saw the video, and you just go, this is some bad news. It's a sad, tragic story. Like, I don't think our soul was created to handle as much bad news as we have. Well, today I'm here to tell you some good news, not about what you need to do, but what Jesus did. The gospel, this is a helpful clarification, the gospel is good news, it's not good advice. I know we all want good advice. That's why you listen to the podcast that you listen to, right? That's why the self-help section of the bookstore is always in the front and growing the biggest. Good news is fine, or good advice is fine. Three steps to that and four hacks for your marriage and seven ways to be a better parent and three ways to get in better shape. And the gospel is something different. It's good news, we'll get into this, about what somebody did 2,000 years ago and how it can change your past, your present, and your future. Notice what it says has to happen with the gospel. Look, look here real quick. I, this is a little awkward for me to talk about because it's what I'm doing right here, but just let's look at it. Now I would remind you brothers of the gospel. Here it is, look at this word. I preach to you, which you received and which you stand and by which you're being saved. That's all the things you're supposed to do with the gospel. We'll talk about that in a second. If you hold fast to the word, here it is, I preach to you unless you believed in vain. Okay, again, a little awkward for me to talk about because I'm doing it right now, but preaching is essential. Okay, this is why, okay. Look, at, look around this room for a second. I know you can, we, we designed this room so you can kind of look around. Look around this room right now with me. Guys, this is an incredible room. I want to talk about it for a second, okay? And I'll tell you why. Guys, this room took a lot of time and took a lot of money to build. This was a three year process from finding it to our church with millions of dollars funding it to very carefully designing, particularly how this room would feel, to the long and delayed process until it finally, we've only been here for three months. Why am I telling you all this? I want you to know this. We designed this room for the gospel to be preached. That is literally the purpose of this room. It's interesting, as soon as we built this room, people started emailing us. Can we do this event here? Can we do that event here? Can we do this event here? It's like, this is not an event center. This is a church that is designed for the gospel to be preached. Whether it's in the videos you saw, the baptisms you see, the songs we sing, or me right now. Now, what's your job? My job, and I'm with you to do the other job too, my job's to preach the gospel, your job's to do everything else in this verse. How you doing with that, guys? Are you standing in the gospel? A lot of us stop at receiving the gospel. Standing in the gospel speaks to what Paul David Tripp, an author, calls the nowism of the gospel. He said, here's the, here's the problem with most Christians. I want to talk to the Christians. I know there's a lot of us here tonight. He said, the problem with Christians is Christians go, the gospel, yeah, that was that awesome thing Jesus did 2,000 years ago. And the gospel is that, I mean, when I die a long time from now, I'm gonna be really thankful for the gospel because I'll go to heaven and be like, thank you. He said, that's funny because the only thing that's missing is your life. When you stand in the gospel, it changes you. It changes your identity. It changes your priorities. It changes your community. 
It changes the mission and purpose you have for your entire life. And my question for you this Easter is, let's be honest, give me the real answer, not the right answer. Are you standing in the gospel? He says, because when you stand in the gospel, he says, you're being saved. What does that mean? It means I'm becoming more like Jesus. I'm overcoming the power and pollution of sin in my life. Well, he wants to unpack this gospel more for us. Look at verse three. He wants to tell us about this gospel. Look here. For I delivered to you as of first importance. See, this is why I'm talking about because it, it's the most important thing. What I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. Paul, just, just real quick, Paul wants to tell us where Christianity came from. Now, what's interesting is we live in a time where everybody's obsessed with, well, where their food came from. I know how you guys are. You shop at Whole Paycheck, Whole Foods, whatever you want to call it. Yes. And I know how you guys are. You're, 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 you grab the package, flip it. Up. I'm sorry, it's non-GMO, but it's not grass-fed. It's cage-free, but it's not free-range. I don't even know what these words mean, okay? You don't either. It's okay. We are obsessed with where our food comes from. Guys, we are obsessed with our genetics, like supposedly this whole Ancestry.com thing and everything else is a multi, multi, hundreds of millions of dollars. Swab your mouth, send it in, and we'll tell you all this history. Fair enough. It's so interesting. We're so interested in like, who, where do we come from and, and what's our background? Well, Paul just for a second wants to say, let me tell you where the gospel came from. And he said it wasn't designed or delivered or developed by any human. We would have never thought about this. Here, guys, listen, why? Because every other religion, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful, I just want to be very clear. Every other religion outside of Christianity is the exact same. It's I do something for God and he rewards me. I be a good person. I do more good things than bad things and God owes me. Christianity says no, Jesus Christ does something good for you and freely gives it to you and in response, you believe, repent, and are transformed. So what he's saying here is that we have the word of God that holds the gospel. And, and in the gospel, it's amazing. Think about this. We love the Bible here. That's why if you come back next week and the week after and the week after that, all we do here, by the way, is just walk through books of the Bible. And it's because what God did, this is so cool. We would have never known God if he didn't let us get to know him. That's a, that's a deep thought to think about. Because have you ever tried to get somebody, have you ever tried to get to know somebody that they didn't want you to get to know them? Every guy in here is like, yeah, that one girl in high school. I tried. <laughs> I tried. Right? Have you ever been, right? You ever have that couple over? You're like, I don't get it. Jim and Sally come over and like, we, we, we've been around them for years. We ask them tons of questions. I feel like I don't know them. Why? Because here's why. Because when you're getting to know somebody, it's always more dependent on the person being known whether or not you're gonna to get to know them. So God had to decide, I'm gonna let you know me. The Bible is not a book about man's thoughts about God. The Bible is God's thoughts given to man. Okay, now back to Easter and the empty tomb, because this is what he's getting at. He wants you to know, how would I define the empty tomb? The empty tomb is the most important event in the world done by the most important person in the world. So when you think about Easter, what is it about? It's about the most important person in the world and the most important event that he did. Now, maybe this is self-evident, but I just wanna say this as we, because I'm gonna talk a little bit about Jesus being the most important person in the world, but I have to say this first. And I hope this is not gonna be a surprise to any of you, but I'm afraid it's gonna be a surprise to a couple of you. You are not the most important person in the world. <laughs> some wives just hit their husband, you know, some husbands just hit their wives. Guys, we think, the way that we act, we think that we are the most important person in the world. In part, this is the selfie generation. I was reading this article years ago about the selfie, and this is very interesting to think about, I think. They said, well, here's what's happened with the selfie. When you take the selfie, you are the center of the world and everything else is in the background. And so what's happened here, this is really interesting. We are more than ever obsessed. This is, I'm gonna give you some stats for, or gonna give you a, some info that'll support this in a second. We are the most self-obsessed generation and the most miserable generation 
And that's not an accident, they're connected. Psychologists show, this is non-Christian psychologists, show a direct connection between how much you think about yourself and how unhappy you are. It's basically the same exact thing. I wanna show you a book. This is called Generation Me. This is not written by a Christian. This lady, she teaches, uh, she's a psychologist at San Diego State. Look at the subtitle of the book. Why today's young Americans are more confident, assertive, entitled, and more miserable than ever before. That's right. You can't handle being the most important person in your life. And by extension, because some of you may have low, low, low self-esteem, you struggle with peer pressure, you struggle with people pleasing, you struggle with codependence, okay? Nobody else in your life outside of Jesus Christ can be the most important person. They cannot handle it, right? I love my wife, I love my kids. They're great spouse, great kids, crummy gods, right? If you want to make, I'll tell you how you can make your kids anxious. Some of you are already doing this. Just make them the most important person in your life. Go ahead and put that kind of pressure on them. You want to make sure that your spouse is always failing. I'll tell you how to do it. Make her or him the most important person in your life. Listen, they can't handle it. But here's the problem. Let me explain this problem to us. You and I were designed. We have to to have somebody be more, somebody who is better than us be more important than us. By the way, let me explain this to you. I'll show you, I'll prove it to you right now, even if you're not a Christian. This is why you love to watch sports. Could you imagine if you turned on, you said, all right guys, NC State's you know, in the, this is so exciting, Elite Eight, all that. Let's turn it on. And you turn on March Madness and everybody who played basketball was as good at basketball as you. You'd be like, I hate this sport, this is terrible. The score is four to two and it's in the second half, <laughs> right? Could you imagine if every time you turned on Netflix, all the actors and actresses were as good looking as you and me? <laughs> you wouldn't, you'd cancel your Netflix subscription. I, I tell you that to say, we can't help it guys, we can't help it. We were designed to look at and celebrate someone who's better than us. We just gotta get his name right, his name's Jesus. I wanna to talk to you about Jesus because it's interesting, when you think about Jesus, it's fair to ask the cynical question at some times, it's fair to be a little bit of a cynic sometimes, and to go, why Jesus, right? He's a Galilean peasant, ostensibly. We know by the size of the well in Nazareth that he grew up with less than 100 people in his hometown. They estimate that his house was the size of maybe two parking spots, so whenever you walk out, see, walk, look at two parking spots next to each other and say, okay, that was Jesus' house. He never ran for political office. He never, um, he didn't come from a prestigious family. He didn't travel much. Yet, it's weird. No one has had more books written about him, more songs sung to him, more paintings drawn of them than the Lord Jesus Christ. And why is this? Well, three, three reasons. Well, number one were the claims that he made. And I, and I would just encourage you, because I don't have time to get into it. I'd encourage you to read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They start the New Testament. And, and in there, Jesus has these direct claims where he says, like, I forgive sins. And I came down from, the, from heaven. And I and the Father are one. Those are like the direct claims. It's like, okay. Then there were the indirect claims. The indirect claims are all the things that Jesus did that show he was God. When he's actually forgiven. Not just saying I can forgive sins. When he forgives someone's sin. Or when he accepts worship. So people look at Jesus' life and they see the, the claims that he's made. The second is his character. It's interesting. If you look at Jesus' friends and his enemies, they both had nothing negative to say about his character. Now, you know this. The more, they, like, you know, the deeper a friendship with someone, the more you love them, right? But the more you know their failures and their faults and their flaws, we're so aware of them. So it's interesting that Jesus' friends, when they write the New Testament, say that he was sinless and perfect in every way. But then even his enemies... Right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, all the religious leaders of the day, and that's a whole other sermon, how... The people who were in religious leadership were his greatest enemies. Anyway, their main accusation against him is that he blasphemed because he said he was equal with God. But if he really is who he says he is, then he didn't even do that, and that accusation doesn't stand. But what we really need to look at, what has, what has changed people's lives in regards to Jesus and, and caused a response of worship is the events around Jesus' life. So I wanna talk about these events. I already read them to you, but we all know events are important, guys, right? Some of you are hoping for an event in the future of your life. That's, it'll be an event that your career would take off. 
It'd be an event and you'd meet him or her, or you'd get married. It'd be an event and you'd have a kid. And, and a lot of us can look back on our lives, right? It, it, the longer you live, the more you can look back on your life and you realize there are you know, sometimes five or 10 key events in my life and that defined my life. It was who you married or how many kids you had or the career path that you took. You look at an event in the past or it, Google this when you get home. Google you know, greatest events in world history. I can't name them all, obviously, but you'll see things like the Industrial Revolution or the invention of the printing press or World War, World War I, World War II, American Revolution, French Revolution, whatever. Here's my whole point. I want you to think about this. This is really neat. Events that happened in the past before you were born affect you now. I think about this with 9-11. I mean, I was, uh, I think I was in sophomore in high school when 9-11 happened. And I remember what it was like to fly before 9-11 and I remember what it's like to fly after 9-11. And every person who ever goes to an airport after 9-11 is affected by that event. Well, I wanna tell you about an event. Hopefully it's been clear already, but we're gonna talk about it. We've sung about it. I wanna talk to you real quickly about the, the, the four events that are mentioned in the life of Christ that happened in the past but affect you today. But you have to believe and receive and stand in them. Let me show you them. Let's read it one more time. So I'm gonna be in verse three. For I delivered to you as of first importance that which I received, here it is, here's the events, that Christ, the most important person in the world, died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. So let's just talk about them quickly. Four events. For some of you, this is just gonna be a reminder, but I hope part of my job is to try to take the familiar and make it fresh. So I hope this Easter you'll stand in this anew. If you're a believer already, you'll receive this. The first thing it says that Jesus did was he died on the cross for our sins. Now, Jesus, if he had just died on the cross, I mean that, respectfully, that in and of itself, being crucified, is not that big of a deal. But what I mean by that is there have been, I don't know exactly how many, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who have been crucified. Being crucified, as horrible as it was, was unbelievably common. The Romans, you know, they just perfected execution. How could we kill a person in a way that would definitely kill them? This, is, this was the thought process of the crucifixion. How do we kill somebody in a way that will definitely kill them, but also do it in the most painful way possible, but also do it in the slowest way possible? And they came up with crucifixion. But, I mean, guys, tens of thousands of people have been crucified. We don't sing songs to them. We don't build churches around them. We don't say they're God. The thing is, it says why Jesus died. Now, I want you to know, you need to think about this for a while because it's possible to be in church and not be in Christ, okay? I grew up, you know, I grew up as a Catholic boy, okay? I was Catholic, you know, first 15, 16 years of my life. And if you've never been to a Catholic church, okay, it's very different than, than the way this is set up. But one of the things you'll see when you go in there is, is, is not a cross, but a crucifix. By the way, the difference between a cross and a crucifix is a crucifix, Jesus is still on the cross. And I remember seeing it. It's a strange thing to see as a six-year-old. Strange thing to see as a 14-year-old. A guy dying on the, and I, I'll be honest, maybe I'm, just, maybe I'm more dense than you are, okay? I just didn't get it. I didn't get it that Jesus died for me. See, the reason Jesus went to the cross was to deal with your biggest problem. Your biggest problem is not financial. Your biggest problem is not your boss or your spouse or your kids. You know, your, your biggest problem is not your lack of education. Your biggest problem is not a health concern. The Bible says your biggest problem is God's problem with you in your natural sinful state. And Jesus goes to the cross to solve our biggest problem. See, if, I don't know if you noticed this tonight, all the people, it's kind of hard to see their shirts, but everybody that we baptize and everybody that baptizes wears the same shirt. It's a very simple shirt, it only has four words because we try to, take, we try to make the main things the plain things and the plain things the main things and we're like, how do we just, what's the simplest way to explain Christianity? Could we do, could we do it in four words? And we think we did. Jesus in my place. Jesus died for us. Jesus died instead of us. Jesus died in our place. See, here's what the Bible says. You need a substitute, not a second chance. Lots of people think they need a second chance. Just let me try again, let me try again. It's like, you don't need a second chance. You need a substitute. Look, if you know your Bible at all, the classic example of somebody who got a second chance was Noah. Do you remember this? It's like, all right, Noah, we're starting over. 
Everybody's gone, and it's just you and your seven family members. And do you remember the first thing Noah does when he gets off the ark? He gets drunk. It's like, oh, God's like, oh, no, right? You don't need a second chance. You need a substitute. I've got a seven-year-old son. He's pretty good at basic math. If I try to have him take an algebra test, it doesn't matter how many chances I give him, he'll never pass that test. He needs somebody else to take it for him. God desires two things of your life, that your life be perfect and your sins be punished. So why did Jesus, why didn't Jesus just come down on the weekend and die? I don't mean that disrespectfully. Why not come down on the weekend, die, go back to heaven? Because he needed to live your life as an infant, as a baby, as a toddler, as a young adult, as a fully grown man, and he needed to obey in all the places you have failed. Because guys, here's what sin does to us. Sin, sin, remember it says he died for our sins. Sin does three things, sin enslaves us. And some of you are there. The biblical word for addiction is slavery, right? And the amount of people over my 20 years of ministry that I've met that they cannot believe what they've gotten themselves into. And they feel like there's no way to get out, right? They, what's the old saying? Sin will take you further than you wanna go, charge you more than you wanna pay, keep you longer than you wanna stay. The second thing sin does to you is it makes you dirty. I've talked to guys before that after they do something they know they shouldn't do, look at something they know they shouldn't look at, sometimes they'll say, I, I feel like I need to take a shower. Why would that be? It's because their soul is telling their body they're dirty. Sin enslaves. Sin corrupts us. It corrupts our character. It hardens our heart. That's how we get into all the things we get into. You don't get in there overnight, you get in there over time. But sin makes us guilty. See, guilt is to the soul what pain is to the body. It tells you something's wrong. The problem with the world today is they don't know what to do or where to go with their guilt. We can take it to Christ. He says he died for our sins. It says he was buried. That means he was really dead. Guys, if you didn't get it, the, the video we showed you at the beginning, when it's going the one direction, that's what the disciples felt on Friday and Saturday. While he was buried in the tomb, clothed like a mummy. And when it goes reverse is what they felt like when they realized the tomb was empty. Jesus was buried, but then it says Jesus was raised. This is what we celebrate at Easter. It means that we serve a living Christ. I heard a story last week about a priest. The truth, this is a true story. And he was at, you know, something with like, I don't know, I think it was about 25 nuns. And he had done this. He was, he was I guess, mentoring them or discipling them or teaching them something. This is a real story. He had these 25 nuns here. He said, guys, I want to ask you a question. Who's the greatest living person? I want you to write it down. I want you to hand it in. He said of 25 nuns, only three wrote down Jesus' name. He said, did you forget he's alive? How different would your life be really if you believed Jesus was alive? How about your quiet time or your devotional tomorrow? How about the way you prayed? How about the way you interacted with your family? How different would it be if you really believed that, right? By the way, this is what I... Whenever I'm preparing, I always think this one question to myself. What would it be like if we really believed this? But then he spends the most time, guys, talking about how he appeared. Did you notice that? Look, I mean, let me just read it to you. I haven't even got there yet, but I want to read it to you. <clears throat> Verse five. And he appeared to Cephas. That's Peter. And then to the 12. And then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Most people think that's his half-brother James. Then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Paul's like, God, I got to see him. For I am least of all the apostles unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Okay, after Jesus rose from the dead, the Bible tells us that he appeared physically and repeatedly to both individuals and groups, men and women, for over 40 days. I've told you this before if you've been coming around. Christians don't believe today what the first Christians believe. We believe what the first Christians witnessed with eyewitness account and therefore believed. Now, this should, when we read this, this should shock us and, may, and we should say, I'm all in if this happened, right? Because if you went to someone's funeral on a Friday and then you see them at Trader Joe's on Sunday, <laughs> what's going on? 
I was at your funeral. We, here's the thing, guys. The resurrection requires a response. I want you to go back. He, he, says, he says he appears to Cephas. He appears to, you know, to 500. He says, he appears to James. He appears to all the apostles. And then look at verse eight. Last of all, as to one untimely born. In the Greek, that's the idea of like a premature baby. He's like, I, I, I shouldn't even been born. I almost didn't make it. That's what he's saying. He, Paul, by the way, never got over the gospel. He says this. He says, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of Christ. It's Easter, and we try to do a version of this every time the church gathers, but I wanna give you a chance to think about this Easter message, no matter where you are here. Whether you, whether, listen, if you've been a believer for years, I wanna just challenge you on, on Saturday night, the night before Easter, as we celebrate as a church family, like, what would it look like, guys, if you really believe this? What would it really, if you just really realize, man, the tomb is empty, so therefore my life doesn't need to be. Therefore there's, I have access to the living God. But I wanna to talk to a whole other group of you because here's the thing about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not a signpost. He is a fork in the road. And I remember, I, I've told some of you this before, I, I, I did college ministry at Duke University to a bunch of fraternities. And I, I, I had a Bible studies at one point, believe this or not, in eight different fraternities. And, I, and, and what they would do is I'd get them to invite me into the fraternity meetings one time and I'd have about, they'd give me like three minutes and they would do this horrible introduction. Here's a religious guy here, he wants to talk. I'm like, oh gosh. So I'd finally get up there and I'd try to, hey guys, hold on. And I, and I basically say, hey guys, listen. Jesus Christ is worshiped by a billion people on earth. His life splits human history in half. Would you guys be willing to do a four week Bible study just to look at his life? And for some of you, you're, you're seeking and I just wanna say, man, what would it look like for you to take your next step, whatever it is? We're gonna take it with you if you want to. What does it take for you to do your next step to say, man, what if this was really true? I wanna ask you, we had some people on Thursday night receive Christ personally in our service. I wanna ask you this, have you ever received Christ personally? I'm not asking, like, you know, did you grow up religious in church going? I'm not asking, are you a good person? You know, I, I'm not asking, have you been baptized? I'm asking, have you ever personally embraced and received Christ? You, some people didn't ever receive Christ. You know why? Because no one ever told them how. It's like, well, how would I do that? The Bible says right there, receive them, stand in it. How do I do that? Well, I just want to tell you, it's not that hard. People have been doing it for 2,000 years. It's the ABCs. You admit that you're a sinner. It's so freeing. You know what you do when you admit you're a sinner? The Bible says, here's what you do. You agree with God. It's like, God, I've been trying to act like I'm something different than you say I am. I agree, I'm a sinner, and what I need is a savior. I'm not a mistaker who needs a life coach. I don't just make mistakes and have accidents and little indiscretions. No, I am a sinner. And this is amazing. The second thing you can do is you can just believe. Believe is you transfer trust from yourself to Jesus. Another thing I used to say to college students when I would do college ministry, we'd be meeting, and I'd share the gospel with them, and I'd be wanting them to respond, and They'd say, well, I need to think about it. And I'd say, well, let me tell you something. You can believe before you get to your dorm. So just make it real. So you can believe right now where you are. And you don't have to understand. I don't understand everything. You can say, I don't understand everything. In fact, the Bible, listen, you believe so that you can understand. And then the third is you confess. You just go public with it. And that's what we saw 11 people do tonight. It's just like, listen, Christianity is unbelievably personal, but it's just not private. And so if you'll bow your heads, if you'll close your eyes, I just want to give us a moment to do this. If that's you, I mean, look, I, I think about myself all the time. I think about 16-year-old Kyle walking into this room as a nominal Roman Catholic and not knowing what's going on. And maybe that's some of you today. And you say, I've never heard any of this. I've never understood that, that Easter is about the most important person and the most important event. I've never, no one's ever asked me to personally receive Christ. Well, I'm doing that tonight. I wanna to ask you to personally receive Christ. I wanna ask you to bank your life on the empty tomb. I want you to say, I'm all in. 
If that's you, I want you to just say this with me. I want you just in your heart to just admit that you're a sinner. Just, you know, you know what you've done. And the great thing is there's nothing you can do that will keep you from the grace of God. So you just, you just tell God right now, God, I am a sinner. I agree with you. I know I've crossed the line. I know I've done things you don't want me to do. The second is you can just believe. You just reach out. You just welcome Christ into your life. You just say, you will be the most important person in my life. You will be the sun in the solar system of my life. I will do what, I, what those people in the baptismal did. I'll say, I'll go anywhere and I'll do anything and I'm fully trusting to what you've done. And I wanna give you a chance tonight with every head bowed and every eye closed. I just, if that's you, if you would say for the first time ever, you have personally received Christ, would you just put your hand in the air? Would you just let me agree with you and just see it? And just say, yes, Lord. I trusted Christ tonight. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, we just pray for all of us, Lord. That's the amazing thing about the empty tomb, about the message of Easter, about the gospel. It's so simple that we could explain it to a five-year-old and they could receive Christ. And it's so bottomless and deep that we can spend our lives studying it, meditating on it, and thinking about it. We, we thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.